Hello, everybody. Today I'm joined by Mark Latham for just a bit of a sit down chat um, and a conversation about who he is, where he's come from and where he is going in our wonderful little industry. So, Mark, it's a pleasure to sit down with you once again. It's great to be back. Yeah, thank you. So I suppose for a lot of people, they know a lot of designers have come out of, uh, of the sort of the games workshop ilk. Um, where they, they work their way through the ranks, so to speak. But I want to take you back slightly before that. Um, oh. <laughs> your actual introduction to gaming itself, where where did you come from and, and how did you get here? Well, we're going to some kind of regression therapy then. Yeah, that's, uh, that's yeah, fun. Very, yeah. very much. So just <laughs> lie back and uh, tell me any of the good things about your hobby. I, When I was a kid, I absolutely loved sort of fantasy, the fantasy genre. And I was I was kind of brought up on those kind of eighties fantasy movies, so like I still you know like Krull and the Beastmaster and all the cheesier the better you know the really low budget mm-hmm. stuff. But then I was absolutely captivated by this TV commercial for Hero Quest back in the day, which was the it was like all those cheesy things come true, and there were these little models and some rules. And um, honestly, picked up that game and never looked back. That was the turning point of my entire life. That kind of you know, you know, it was that and Space Crusade, which was the follow-up, yeah. um, the kind of sci-fi follow-up, um, and that completely got me into Games Workshop. Uh, f- from there, it was buying copies of White Dwarf and, in fact, Dragon Magazine, getting into RPGs and all that kind of. I just couldn't get enough of those fantasy gaming elements. Um, I kind of picked up a bunch of uh, Choose Your Adventure fighting fantasy books as well at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and ended up playing uh, Dungeoneer, which is the advanced fighting fantasy role-playing game. So I've got this kind of hero quest thing going on. I've got role-playing games going on. It was just a matter of time before a games workshop store opened in my area, and I was in there. So I thought, oh, my God, I want to buy this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's a familiar tale, I'm sure. Many people will be remembering that. I think everyone from kind of our age group kind of just remembers the Hero Quest TV TV had the fire of wrath, all that kind of stuff. Oh, sword. <laughs> oh, sword. <laughs> uh, so was it always the, the fantasy side that attracted you? I know you said you picked up Space Crusade as well, or was it just that sort of broad spectrum of uh, I suppose non non historic, non realistic sort of background themes? Yeah, it's fairly broad, I think. I think all of my, um, I said broad in a funny way, then like broad, sold, doing it again. So, uh, yeah, so it was, it was a fairly broad uh, interest. All the TV shows and, and media I consumed at that time, all the comic books, it was all sci fi, fantasy, superhero stuff. Um, you know, just a total geek, you know. <laughs> um, I think fantasy was my first inroad into gaming. Um, but weirdly, the very first thing I picked up when I went to Games Workshop was 40k. Uh, I remember I went to, went to the GW store in Stoke-on-Trent, the grand opening, um, with my little vouchers from White Dwarf to get some mm. money off. Uh, and I kind of went in there expecting to buy some Warhammer stuff and maybe buy a Warhammer box set. Mm. Uh, and I came away with the Road Trader rulebook and a land speeder and a box of space marines. And I had no idea what I was doing with that stuff, you know, vaguely recognized them from Space Crusade box art, but, yeah. you know, uh, but I mean, Road Trader is such a great book, isn't it? Kind of part role playing game, part oh, sci fi yeah. tabletop. It's just fantastic. Yeah, but I always felt it was more RPG than, than tabletop anyway, which means it didn't really matter what you were buying in the early days of, yeah, of exactly. the Games Workshop because everything fitted in somewhere and you could use something somehow. So, it, it wasn't even a case of, oh, I've bought the wrong stuff for the game or the wrong stuff for the wrong game. You could go, well, you know, Slan have quite clearly dropped these people or somebody's fallen out of the warp and now you've got Marines being attacked <laughs> by elves. It's all, it's all fine. We're all fine here. The, uh, I remember the kind of the unexpected events table mm-hmm. in, in Road Trader. Um, that made such a lasting impression on me that I kind of insisted when I, when I worked on Many years later, when I got the chance to work on a 40k edition, it was a sixth edition book, mm. um, and I kind of insisted that we put one of those in. I think I got, um, I think it was Adam Troke who, who actually wrote it in the end because he lo- he also loved Road Trader, but it was it's kind of my we've got to get this big table of narrative events in the book somehow. <laughs> Just a throwback to people like me. <laughs> it, you know, it's it's one we all appreciate, and it also introduces it to a new generation who possibly hadn't seen it the first time around and and so things like that really yeah. get, uh, get gamers going so 
from that initial sort of period, um, did you continue playing throughout school and, and did it sort of define where you wanted to go or what, what were your plans throughout school and coming out of it? Because not everybody sits down and goes, I want to be a games designer or a writer or no. those sort of things. They, they generally sort of, some, some do, but most people segue in via the hobby later on. Yeah, I think I've been quite lucky in that respect. When I was at school, I wanted to be an either an editor or an artist. <laughs> they were my two they were my two things. A magazine editor really or or an artist. And when I when I got um White Dwarf magazine for the first time, it was uh, Robin Dews was the editor back then. Mm. Um I was lucky enough to kind of meet him years later and work with him a little bit. Um great shoes. Honestly, he, nice. he's famous for his amazing shoes. Um, <laughs> did, did they have spats? Was it that sort of thing? Yes. Yes. Glittery spats. Awesome. That, I wish I was is. joking. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> I'm glad you're not. <laughs> Who would have thought? I know. What's, what's happening beneath that photograph in Weird, the White yeah. Dwarf? Yeah. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> when I got White Dwarf magazine, I started getting it regularly. I wanted to be a White Dwarf editor. So literally age 14 or 15. That became my career ambition. I just switched switch tracks. None of this comic artist nonsense. I want to be White Dwarf editor. Uh, I kind of single-mindedly pursued that for years until it happened. Mm-hmm. And, you know, ridiculously lucky to, to get there because mm-hmm. not everyone, uh, everyone wants to be White Dwarf editor, I'm sure. <laughs> kind of. I'm, I'm sure they probably do up until they, they get into White Dwarf and realize it's it's not all plain sailing. It's all, really all, hard. All, all the stress and hassle. <laughs> like the magazine magazine generally are really hard <laughs> i think it was oh i'm gonna go out and let and say jake thornton i think yeah. i heard an interview with him and he was saying whenever he arrived it was hand to mouth that the month's issue was being written that month and he was one of the first editors to try and push it on to get the one month in advance and then two and then three months sort of lead up time yeah and listening to him explain that is is like uh, sisyphus trying to <laughs> you know, push that stone up the hill and you're going well you know it's it's not as easy as it, as it sounds when you're trying to make sure that you've got content full every month if anything later we got too far ahead so we we're working like six or seven months in advance mm-hmm. um which wasn't as far in advance as the main studio uh but it was enough to just be a right pain when you're trying to get articles and trying to right okay it's christmas but it's not so what are we going to do for the Christmas issue? <laughs> it's really difficult. <laughs> I'm in the future, right? <laughs> Everybody wants to be thinking about Christmas in June and July time, I'm exactly. sure. You know. <laughs> Just take down the Easter mm. eggs and start thinking about what you're going to do for, uh, for December. <laughs> yeah. So what, what was your first, um, I suppose, your first job in Games Workshop then? Did you, did you go straight into working... Because you, I know you started off with the the Lord of the Rings strategy battle as as editor yeah. as far as as far as the editing side goes, but was that your your initial introduction into the, the Games Workshop? Uh, I actually worked in a store, the, the Stoke on Trent store, the one that I got my first my first um, toys from, basically. Uh, so I worked there as a part timer, a key timer, as we were called, mm, key time. uh, for about two years while I was at uni, mm-hmm. um, and I just come to the point where I was going to hand in my notice because I'd just completed a, a master's degree uh, and I kind of thought well, I'm not going to do retail forever now I'm kind of I've got to go and, I, was, I think I'm going to do a PhD to be honest which mm-hmm. was this huge kind of oh my god I'm going to do a PhD that's going to be three years and lots of expense and writing essays and teaching at university and ridiculous amount of cerebral work yeah. um, and then my manager in that store just handed me the advert, the job advert for, from head office, which mm-hmm. was kind of circulated internally first, which yeah. was Battle Games in Middle Earth need a, uh, a content provider, I think, mm-hmm. copywriter or something like content provider, I think. Um, why don't you go for this? You're good with words. <laughs> oh, well, I'm quite good with words. I can give that a go. <laughs> you like elves. You like words. You like words on elves. Put them together. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So they were advertising, uh, I think the first movie had just come out, Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second one was almost up for release. I think that was the time period. Uh, so they'd already done the first test issues of this part work called Battle Games in Middle Earth. It was mm-hmm. advertised on TV with a fabulous advert, which I hope you can put the link for in the comments or something because... Oh, uh, oh I will find it, yeah. Oh, I, my word. I remember it was the D'Angostini. Um, yes, that's the one. C- companion so one, great. yeah. You yeah. got a guy standing like Gandalf to the voiceover. It was just awesome. Hmm. 
it's, and it, it's very dramatic as well. It's always like, he, he always emphasised the wrong bits. So it's always like, three in issue one, 12 Mario Goblin, and a paintbrush. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> he, he learned his acting from the school of William Shatner. <laughs> that paintbrush is very exciting. Very exciting. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so I kind of went for a couple of interviews for that and got the job, and that was just very bizarre. And it was just, it was very kind of bottom of the ladder. It was mm. this low paid writing copy for fun and profit not much profit, um, painting miniatures, building scenery. So th that job interview is all about, are you a hobbyist? Can you paint models in a clear and concise way and show people how to do it? Can you? And I was like, yes, I was a key time in a store. Of course I can. That was my day job. <laughs> Handy to have. Yeah. Can, not only can I, but I have been and will be for some time, I imagine. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, got, kind of landed that job and it all began. The, the, the magazine passion began, really. So it started off as, um, as as adding the content to the magazine. So was was it solely the hobby side, or were you given sort of a, a free rein within that to write whatever you felt might be an interesting article? Were you, were you given sort of carte blanche to to go in and design scenarios and things like that, or was it oh, simply to supplement the? the well, game? we were we were a very small team, and mm -hmm. we were very much involved in planning the whole range of magazines, which they were they were called packs. We couldn't call them mm -hmm. magazines for weird licensing reasons so there was a pack which in, which was a paper product which mm -hmm. is suspicious for like a magazine and then a bunch of other components that came with it uh, trying to explain this to kind of our american listeners is always difficult do you know what a part work is no right it's it's a thing where <laughs> you get free stuff on the front of every issue it's like a book but you have to buy it week by week but you yeah, get extra exactly. stuff for doing it <laughs> and at the end you've got a complete book it's just taking you a while and yes, and it's cost you 10 times more than the actual book would have cost. <laughs> God bless them. Where would we be without them? Uh, but the, the, to be honest, the Lord of the Rings one and the, the later GW ones are just great value, to be honest. Mm. The, the, getting 12 Mario Goblins, some paints and a paintbrush, as the guy said on the advert, uh, mm. for one ninety nine was the first issue. Yeah. Insane. We sold a million copies of issue one. Wow. I think that says it all. Really. One million copies of a magazine. That's that, circulation figures that any that Vogue would die for. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, very much. So. And also, it sets the bar very, very high for issue two, doesn't it? <laughs> it's going, oh, no. You, you'd almost preferred half a million, at least. Then you've got room to expand, and it still looks <laughs> impressive. The way they'd set it up, they'd basically done uh, the, the test, which is they find a very small region mm -hmm. i think was like oh it was somewhere in the north of england i think for the for the first test mm -hmm. they put the tv advert out on local tv only and they sell it in news agents in that area only mm -hmm. and they only do four issues uh, just to gauge how well it sells with that demographic okay. and then when the when the main product launches they tweak and change it based on the feedback they've received mm -hmm. and so it's a weird way of doing it because they kind of lie to people they, they, they don't tell them there's only four issues coming. They, they literally say, right, he was here. It's the TV advert. It's the, it's the real thing. And then you, then you buy it. And I think, you, I think you get the, if you subscribe to the main magazine later, you get the first four issues free as a, as a story we like yeah, to you kind yeah, of thing. Bad, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it kind of happens everywhere. They just pick a different region every time. Yeah. Um, so that had already been done. It would be cobbled together by a bunch of guys at Games Workshop. Um, and then they put the team together because they knew they were going to get the green light and get launched properly. So they put a proper a proper team together as they hired externally. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of turned up we really, just about six of us, I think. There's two writers, two designers, editor, manager uh, at first. And then, yeah, just stuck us in a little office and off we went. Um, so we worked quite closely with the Lord of the Rings team, the, mm -hmm. the main rules team. Celestio Cavatore was the, uh, the Lord of the Rings guru at that time. Sure. Um, and Matt Ward joined either the same time or shortly after us as kind of working with Alessio um, mm -hmm. and, and those two guys became the main game designer. Um, they say ripped, we say rift, you know. So, <laughs> uh, it was great and we kind of, it became quite a good relationship. We did sort of feed into each other quite a lot because basically you, you couldn't, you almost couldn't buy playtesting like we provided because you've got a, a dedicated team playing games and writing scenarios and mm. coming up with new content and trying to explain the rules in a very, very simple way to newcomers mm. um, every single week, week in, week out. 
and so they were getting live feedback on oh actually when you try when you break this rule down <laughs> and i suppose at that stage um cause that that would have been early 2000s so ndas means that you can't go for extensive play testing anyway even even inside the company I no. imagine, at that stage because the the play testing would have been um so under wraps that that having a a core of people that you can literally just walk around the corner and go how did that work balrog's too brutal you say okay i've worked on so many licensed products since then Mm -hmm. but none of them have been anywhere near as secretive as the lord of the rings it was an unbelievable experience Mm. we had to go to a different part of the building to view uh, film stills imagery and scripts there was in a a code locked room Mm-hmm. with no no scan in because anything electrical can be hacked so a code locked room with a computer in there that wasn't linked to a server and a big big cd tower and you'd go through physical cds of movie stills and you'd wow. put them into the computer to view them and then you'd sign out the cd and take it back to your office <laughs> <laughs> to put to give it to the graphic designer yeah yeah. <laughs> all, all I'm picturing now is Richard Pryor in Superman 3 trying to turn the two keys simultaneously, like 12 yeah. feet apart, <laughs> it's nuts. just to just to get a, a look at what Gandalf looks like when uh, he's smoking some Hobbit weed. There was a whole bunch of like forbidden imagery as well, which is quite funny, like outtakes, which were on the CDs. Yeah. But they weren't really labels. Just, just, yeah, to so kind you of just use suddenly it. hit something. Some, sometimes things would get accidentally used. You know, you'd have that, the, the, the infamous scenes of the Moria goblin dabs in the forest all lying dead, where they they'd clearly filmed a battle uh-huh. that happened happened in Los Lorien, but they, they never showed it on, in, in the movie. And then that appeared in early magazines. And it was like, no, no, you can't use that anymore. It didn't make, <laughs> didn't make the cut. And weird scenes in the scripts that never got filmed or weird outtakes of Mary and Pippin licking uruk blood off swords and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's a scenario waiting to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so how long, how long were you working there before you took over as editor then? Uh, probably just a year, to be honest. Yeah. That was a really weird thing because I always had that ambition to be an editor. I kind of went in quite single-minded. Mm. And in the interview, the editor and the production manager were doing the interview and they, and they were like, where do you see yourself in five years' time? Or three years' time? And I said, in three years' time, I want your job. Mm. And then in five years' time, I don't know, White Wolf maybe? Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, good. it's good to show them where you want to be. Because you were, yeah. I mean, it wasn't far off that, was it? Um, going from the, the, the part work to White Dwarf itself. Yeah, yeah it was, it kind of was a three-year plan, wasn't it? I think yeah. I did the part work for three years-ish total. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I became the editor of, of that when, uh, so Graham Davey was the editor before. Um, he'd previously been production editor on White Dwarf in mm-hmm. the UK. Um, and then he did Battle in the Middle Earth, and then he went to the studio. So right. I basically just followed his trajectory. Then I, I later became studio editor, so I just, yeah, just copied him, basically. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so he went to the studio editor. Literally following in his footsteps yeah. in a very it's, nervy kind of way. I just yeah, had to imagine him in the canteen, in Bugman's, and then just shadowing him. <laughs> and it's just in your chair now, and then, then I've got your job. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but when you were working for White Dwarf, obviously it's a, I suppose it's the flagship um publication for games workshop was yeah. there more focus on you and the editorial work you were doing there than you had on the the lord of the Rings side because it was comparatively sort of different different teams doing different jobs essentially um and yeah. what you were trying to achieve was that was it more of a this is what we need from you or did you find ways to to bring your own stamp to the, the white dwarf magazine because certain editors are are known for having change parts of it or brought things in or move things around and sort of make it their own version of white dwarf did, did you find that yourself yes and no um so in terms of freedom and, and eyes on the product there's, there's definitely more managerial involvement in white dwarf um mm-hmm. and in fact when i joined white dwarf that was that was more true than ever before because it was a huge relaunch huge kind of upheaval <laughs> and um so my first issue, although I don't think I was credited in that issue, was UK 316, which is US 315, which is the uh, the giant issue, the infamous giant issue. Yes. Which some people love or hate, you basically. Uh, but what people don't realize is the reason that came about 
And it was because White Dwarf had got to a point where there were six or seven uh, different White Dwarfs across the world. Mm. So every region had its own White Dwarf team. Uh, the central team and the UK team were separate. Mm -hmm. The central team would create content, like 96 pages of content, which was studio approved. They send it out to all the international teams, including the UK team, mm -hmm. who weren't compelled to use any of it. Right. I didn't realize uh, that. So it was, that. It was that almost bizarre. A, it is bizarre. They, they, it was almost kind of a, a gentleman's agreement that mm. you should probably feature all the new release stuff, mm. but you don't have to. So most people kind of do the battle report and the new releases section, and then they just ignore the rest and just mm -hmm. do their own crazy stuff. And some countries did more crazy stuff than others. I'm not going to name names. Spain, we're looking at you. <laughs> so, there was some, yeah. I, it, I, I have so, several white dwarves from other countries because if I ever went abroad or friends went abroad and they found them, they would bring them back for me. So, so <laughs> I've, I've seen some of the things uh, other other editors and teams were up to. That, that is, it's fascinating though that, essentially have people doing work that may not be used to, you know, yeah. I assume I assume that was part of it then that they were going well, why are we why are we wasting time and resources very much in making something that is just going to be ignored you had two white dwarf teams in in HQ alone yeah sending out their stuff to other white dwarf teams and that, that was kind of odd mm -hmm. and so there's a resource issue there yeah um, there's a quality control issue because there was no templates or guidelines of how the magazine had to be laid out or presented Mm -hmm. They could change the cover. They could lay things out using their own graphic designers. And they could do whatever they wanted, right? Um, and there were a few issues around the world. You know, we're not going to blame Spain because actually there were there were other. They weren't the culprits in this particular instance. There were a few issues where some stuff got through that was really not on message mm -hmm. on brand for Games Workshop, and that got to the the ears of the CEO, and, and it just became a right, we've got to change this. What we should do is we should have a central White Dwarf team who uh, create the content uh, and it's sent out and then the other countries just print it. Just translate issues. Basically, you translate the text and you change any uh, terminology and prices and anything that's specific to your territory. And then we'll give you a bit at the back where you can do your local news. Uh, but that's kind of the way it's got to be now. Mm -hmm. um, so as a result, um, I remember, so I was the first person recruited to this new White Dwarf team, and it was very secret. Mm. And they put me in a room on my own next door to the design studio, and people would walk past going, hey, Mark, what are you doing in here? And I'd just have to hide paper under my, <laughs> under my, <laughs> and stuff. I I couldn't say. Go away. I was, all I was doing was just, I was told, edit these pages and don't tell anyone what you're doing. <laughs> so, yeah. And then just sit in this room. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, the, the Cold War had less secrecy in some <laughs> respects. And what they were doing, they were going around picking their dream team, basically. They were recruiting uh -huh. people from other teams, and then eventually they put us all in that room. That yeah. was quite, that's quite hot and sweaty, to be fair. It's a small room. Uh, <laughs> and then eventually they moved into the studio. Um, but what happened was they, they kind of templated the whole magazine. Hmm. And it became this heavily, right, what we're going to do, we're going to strip everything out, go back to basics, change the logo, design, uh, make every article look fresh and clean and different. Mm -hmm. We're going to take most of the words out, and more pictures, fewer words. Uh, and eventually we'll, once we've done this kind of nuke everything and we've got a clean slate, we'll start to work out from feedback mm -hmm. what, what works, what doesn't, works, what, doesn't and, yeah. what we should do more of, what we should do less of. Um, but the problem is, so them did the giant issue, which is very much it. It's a kind of huge, oh my God, 50 pages of giant content. Mm. And people were like, oh God, this, this new white dwarf is terrible. So it's a great big advert. But that was the template. It was an experiment, really. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, because we were working so far ahead, it took us six months to start implementing the changes. Correct. Yeah. So there were like six issues of White Dwarf, which seemed like very, very, uh, very corporate because mm -hmm. we hadn't quite found that tone and style that we were building towards. We are having all those meetings and things in the background and working on how we're going to make this great in the future, but we hadn't been able to implement it yet. Mm -hmm. And everything was going through multiple layers of sign-off because management was so paranoid that they were going to get in the same place again. Sure. So that's, that's why there were no photos of the editors. And like I wasn't even, I was deputy editor at first. I wasn't even credited in the first issue. Um, and then I think Guy Haley came in, but he had to be Grom Brindle. <laughs> <laughs> and he had to write the editorial as Grom Brindle. Well, yeah. It's that, the idea of take the personality out completely. Yeah. Because um, then people won't be tempted to massage their own egos by making their own their own content. Sure. It was a very strange time. Mm 
Mm. I, I imagine it would be. And it was it was in that sort of that mix that I think I I came across the first one of your actual games, um, which was based off the Lord of the Rings strategy battle game, which yeah. was Legend of the Old West. Was that your first or my? That was my first, yeah, my first yeah. freelance solo gig because I've been working on Lord of the Rings. I'd, I'd kind of almost become a developer at that mm-hmm. point because I spent like two years just kind of writing scenarios and playing stuff. And some of the mini games that we'd done in battle games in Middle Earth had actually found their way into White Dwarf, stuff like that, the Wizards Duel game and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just seemed a natural step. And I was battle games in Middle Earth. I was kind of working in the great big office with uh, Black Library for a while. Mm-hmm. And in the Black Library office was also Warhammer Historical. And I ended up chatting to Rob Broom at Warhammer Historical quite a lot. And he kind of, he'd had this dream of doing some historical games that were kind of cinematic historical games, semi, yeah. semi-cinematic, um, that were based on the Lord of the Rings system. So then it was a case of, I, had to, I kind of went to me, oh, what shall I do? Wild West would be awesome. I went away and talked to Rick Priestley about whether he'd mind and Rick didn't care. He's like, yeah, whatever, it sounds great. <laughs> sounds like Rick, yeah. <laughs> uh yeah so i went back to rob and pitched it and he was all over it and then we did it and they were the most successful warhammer historical books yeah. just i mean the first full color books first full first full color rule books games workshop had made yes so as a result of that the designer pete borlice uh he was my partner in crime on battle games and fellow freelancer um, he went to become the studio art manager for quite mm-hmm. a while as a result of his work on that, in order to make studio books full color. Yeah. I, I mean, they were a fantastic set of books. Um, but we, we played them extensively um, in, in, well, I'm going to say in our gaming group, our gaming group was more or less GW Belfast, which was both <laughs> current and past members. Cause you know, we would just have a, essentially a games night once a week because there's a table there and there's nowhere else to play in Belfast. Uh, strange, <laughs> strange way as things were. But uh, I mean, we, we, we raided every cowboy like uh, figure that we could find from any company. We could find them just to put them on the table. And there was that, um, it was a change of direction almost for Warhammer historical, even though it was, it was semi official. It was, it was a strange little sort of splinter of, um, of games workshop. Uh, and yeah. you're never you're never really entirely certain where they fit in. It was, it was like, are they are they just being allowed to do it because it's the Perrys and John Stellard and and uh, Jervis Johnson are really keen on it, or or is it like a test bed for things? Nobody really knew, but the the products that were produced by Warhammer Historical were absolutely sensational. So much so that they still have legs to this day, despite being being gone for a, a long time. Yeah, I think. Uh, that kind of oddity of where do we stand, that was true internally as well. I think that we really knew. So um, I remember as deputy editor kind of going, so we're going to start putting a little column in White Dwarf about Warhammer historical releases, right? Now this seems kind of weird because I've just done one. Mm. <laughs> Have and, you heard and, about this new game that this talented, yeah. handsome young editor has made? But I was very proud of it because I was kind of, yeah. we've just done this whole exercise of not putting ego into the magazine. But yeah. like the only release for Warhammer Historical this month is mine. And the only artwork we have for it, because the artwork isn't in yet, is mm. my piece. Mm-hmm. That, that What I drew is not that good. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to put that in White Dwarf, right? That just seems weird. Um, and the editor made the call that, yes, we should do it. Yeah. Um, because it's a product that we're releasing, so we should do it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> So whenever you went, whenever you approached changing it up from the the Lord of the Rings into the the uh, Legends of the Old West, was that you sort of looking at it from a a challenge, a design challenge point of view, um, or did you look at it as as just a, a sort of a more an editorial? It, oh, it's the, the groundwork's there. All I need to do is dress this up in a in a new way to make it work. Uh, the groundwork was there. I think I did, yeah, I probably did a bit more to the system maybe than I needed to. Mm-hmm. Although saying that, I probably would do it. I'd probably go further were I to do it again. Um, I think Robert Warhammer Historical was very keen on just retaining that system as much as possible. And yeah. actually going back an edition and, and keeping it the Fellowship of the Ring edition rules because they were the, the really clean, simple set that Rick Priestley had devised um, rather than all the add-ons that came later. So for the first book, it's really just that streamlined system. 
I think I just kind of made a few changes to make shooting slightly better as opposed yeah. to, to fighting. Uh, I should have done more than that, really. <laughs> the, the feedback I always get is that it's too easy to beat people up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they've got to get close enough to do it, though. <laughs> That's right. Um, but then, really, the, the fun for me was the campaign system. Mm. Uh, and that's something that I think is a signature of my games ever since. It's kind of doing that kind of narrative campaign stuff. I, mm. I absolutely loved Mordheim and the Necron, the campaign system, sure. slightly to a lesser degree, but it's, it's just a very similar kind of thing. And in, Inquisitor, which is a very similar thing. Mm. Uh, it just kind of came full circle because I just loved those games so much. Uh, and the randomness of them too. I'm I'm not really a competitive gamer. It's all about randomness for me. Um, well, I suppose that that sort of segues on quite nicely to moving beyond Games Workshop. And and you did have a few other games uh, for Warhammer Stark. You had Trafalgar and Waterloo. Yeah. But one thing that I've noticed from all of the games that I've I've had a chance to look at that you've written, there is a strong either campaign or narrative element behind them uh, and it is almost a, a feature of your work it, it, that they're not just um what's the best way to put this they're not just a solo or a, a one-off game in and of themselves but every part of the game generally develops the characters or the storyline further so you, you don't have your games shouldn't be in a vacuum they can be, but there's yeah. a wider world to explore in many respects. I suppose that's part and parcel of the narrative side of things. That's Is that what you would think of as your de, sort of de, defining style of, of games design? That narrative campaign system, do you always look to add some form of structure like that into the games? I do. The only times where I haven't done that is because uh, is where the book has been a little bit too short and I haven't been I feel like I haven't had the space to do a campaign section. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Chosen Men from Ospreys, another Napoleonic skirmish where mm -hmm. I wanted to write a campaign system, but I was limited to a 64-page rule book and I just couldn't fit it in. <laughs> which, which is a terrible shame because it's sitting there. And, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't say no for a campaign system. For it. <laughs> that was always the idea, but yeah, it just no. didn't happen. Um, I always try, I, I call it enforced fun. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> basically, yeah, basically... It's a really good term. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, if you're the kind of player who just wants to be ultra competitive, I mean, that, that's for some people that is fun, right? So you mm -hmm. kind of, the, the, the puzzle of which army do I choose and how do I deploy them and, and how do I defeat my opponents in the most crushing way possible. That is yeah. fun for a lot of people. As long as your opponent's in the same mindset, that's great. But for me, it's all about, actually, there's going to be something beyond this game. There's mm -hmm. going to be loads of random roles and the things that you do in your game might affect those random roles. Uh, characters might just die and take no further part in the campaign. They, they might get a leg injury, so they could be limping along for the rest of the campaign. Uh, they might find an incredible sword of doom that is ridiculously unbalanced and not points costed. What are you going to do? It's enforced fun. Go with it. Come up with, come up with yeah. a story to explain it. It's, uh... <laughs> it's one way of doing it. I, I suppose in, in some respects, it surprises me out of all the, the the games you've done so far, I mean, the, the most recent one being Lasting Tales, mm -hmm. which is, I would say, almost borderline RPG. Yeah. But you've only really done, um, I think, two actual RPGs. You, you've done something for Star Wars, and then you did something for the 40K Dark Heresy RPG. Am I right? Yeah. So my RPG uh, stuff has mainly been editorial. Right. So when I went freelance, I kind of have, multiple strings to my bow. There's kind of mm. industry consultancy, uh, games design, background writing, and editing. Mm. So the RPG stuff is mostly editing with a bit of background. Right. So Dark Heresy did some background writing, uh, Star Wars and Star Trek have done editing, um, Lord of the Rings, a bunch of other things. Mm. Oh, I did some uh, scenario design for Call of Cthulhu. That was really good fun. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the Cthulhu Botanica for Cubicle 7. That was an awesome Kickstarter. It's, it's sitting there. Excellent. So yeah, I, I did. I am surrounded by your books, apparently. <laughs> I did Even three scenarios. I the three scenarios for Cthulhu Botanica, and mm. I wrote the the journal of Reginald Campbell Thompson, which was like the the, the faux explorer's yeah, journal. Explorer. <laughs> yeah. oh, we appreciate that wholeheartedly. Is is RPG something that you would um, want to do more of, or is it is it just a, a case that 
as far as the game design part goes, it's something that people come to you to to do rather than wanting to tell a, a sort of a narrative game still yourself. Yeah, I mean, I really like uh, playing RPGs and running RPGs. Mm-hmm. I find the design of them quite esoteric and a bit tricky. I've always kind of noodled ideas for writing a system and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I was kind of working on one years ago with uh, Andy Hall mm-hmm. of uh, Blood Bowl fame. Yeah. Um, but it never got anywhere. And it's just, it's just I don't know, there's, there's something about a rule system that's not fixed. You either go too mechanical, which saps the fun from the storytelling experience, mm-hmm. or you don't go mechanical enough, in which case the rules are almost secondary. Sure. Um, I tend, when, I, when I run RPGs, I tend to just ignore the rules. I'll, be, I'll use the basic core mechanic, yeah. roll, roll 2d10 and work out percentage, whatever it might be, yeah. but everything else is just on the fly. I'm terrible for it. I know there are a lot of people who confuse roll with a double L with roll with an LE. Yeah. Um, what yeah, kind of yeah. role player were you? <laughs> very very much LE, not, not uh, LL. Dice can, dice can take a back seat whenever I need them to take a back seat. Yeah, I think if I ran a D&D campaign for, you, for your average number crunching uh, D&D player, they would hate me. Uh, you know, there are ways and means to get around that. I've, I have a friend who's very much a min-max, and, and whenever he looks at D&D, he's always looking to, what am I buying next when I level up next? Yeah. And, and we beat that out of him by just starting a game at level 20. <laughs> you want to do all that? Tonight, you're generating your character. Sit down and work out all of that, and then we can actually play the game from then on. <laughs> uh, but I ask because I have this darling little book. Oh, and I this this is theoretically not a game um not even the set of scenarios it is just the adventures and i know you've done a bug hunt one but not with osprey with um yeah not with osprey too was it osprey as well yeah i thought, I thought it was somebody else That's and the, the headless horseman was the one right but but these in and of them i mean this i use with cthulhu invictus and it it almost bridges the sort of um the two sides <clears throat> from games design through to just writing because you you have wrote extensively as well uh, as just a an author and these i think are absolutely magnificent books and you can see in them that all it needs is a, a system behind it and thankfully yeah. Cthulhu has a system behind it to turn it into an rpg but I, I look at that and i look at the the bug hunt book as well and you're thinking well these are th- these show a writer more than a games designer and it's like you're just sitting between the pair of them is the loved- one that you prefer over the other i'm i imagine based on cthulhu campaign it's writing <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> yeah. so i do a lot of uh so world building mm. is the really fun part of any writing mm-hmm. okay, so whether i'm writing a novel or a source book or a campaign the world building section is just the really fun part and it's a bit that most people want to do yeah but it's like getting paid for world building is like an utter dream, right? Yeah. Um, so those books from Osprey are just world building with nothing else. No mechanics attached to them. Mm. No, no campaign attached to them, nothing. No, no story, really. It's just snippets of faux history in, in the case of the Cthulhu campaigns. Yeah. I actually offered to, to, to write Bug Hunts the Game for Osprey, um, mm-hmm. but they don't like tying the two things together. They don't right. want to make a game based on the source books. Based on the source book. Strange. It seems like a natural yeah. thing. Yeah, you've got, yeah, well, you know. Then you sell two books instead of one, don't you? The, the marketeer from White Dwarf in me says, well, you sell more books that way, so why, why wouldn't you? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm 100% with you. Because, I mean, it's one of those things, if people pick up the game and go, oh, the game's good, and I wish there was more story and source material, and they go, there's the book. Or if they pick up the book and they go, oh, this would make a terrific game, you go, well, it's funny you say that. Now you bought them both, or one or the other. Yeah, Buy the special yeah. edition with both in a slipcase. Yeah. <laughs> the marketing writes itself. <laughs> have a word with osprey but uh one of the things because you've you've written um several books around sherlock holmes yeah um, and and i know now obviously sherlock is is um is one of those sort of genre defining characters um (laughs) is is that era a lot of interest to you because i know you have your twitter handle is a lost victorian um and You've also done the the um, Apollonian case files as well. So yeah, they were my first series. Yeah. I think I stereotyped myself a little bit at a time mm. cast with right. the Lost Victorian handle. But yeah, um, I, I think I started out to wanting to write Victorian mysteries because mm. I just absolutely love it. I've always loved it. Um, 
the nineteenth century generally is my my big historical passion from whether it's the Wild West or Victorian London. I just absolutely mm-hmm. love it. Um, when I left UW, actually, it's interesting because it was one of those my my role had just changed and I was probably going to have to take a very different job in the studio, uh, mm-hmm. dealing with kind of intellectual property stuff. And it was it's kind of okay, but it wasn't my passion. And then the opportunity came along. I basically got an agent and sold my first novel, which I wasn't expecting to do. And I just went, I'm going to do it. I'm mm. going to leave. I wouldn't recommend this to anybody. It's been absolutely, the first couple of years, we just, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> 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 I would not tell anybody to quit their job and become a writer because it doesn't pay. <laughs> the reason I write games and source books and video games, narratives and stuff mm. like that, the reason I do all that stuff is because writing novels does not pay. <laughs> you know, for, for every uh, jar martin or tolkien or whoever it happens to be out there there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of other yeah, writers exactly, desperately yeah. tracking away but yeah it's it's um it's interesting because when you look through just the the sort of the range of the stuff that you have done obviously there, there's the victoriana stuff but then um things like uh, armada from yeah mantic recently um i got that and there's you've written some of the source material and background for that as again well. I've, I've become one of the background writers for the kings of war setting now so armada mm. and kings of war mm. uh, quite quite recent stuff so yeah so i did a lot of the i did most of the background section if not all of it for third edition kings of war um and then it's I kind of hadn't there. even realized that <laughs> which is terrible of me because i've read that back to back um yeah i think, I think back again it's it, they kind it, of it was a phenomenal advance for the game world. Yeah. Um, specifically because for so long, I think the way Mantic had marketed themselves initially, it was miniatures for Warhammer, essentially. And then there was, oh, we've got a bit of a game. And then the game came out and it had background, but it wasn't fleshed out. Yeah. But that third edition rulebook, the, 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 the source material, the world building in there is absolutely magnificent. The studio not, not team just smoke there, but it's uh, just fantastic. Matt Gilbert, the studio team at Mantic now, yeah, Matt Gilbert and uh, Rob Alderman as well. They mm. they are really passionate, and they've done a lot of work, um, kind of advancing the or creating the Mantic timeline, mm. the Pan the Panathor, Panathor world and the yeah. timeline, and kind of working out how to how to push it as far away from Warhammer as possible, and kind of really lean mm. into the, the the tropes that they've created over the years. Um, so they came to me with this kind of wealth of structure as can you put this into a consistent narrative it's, it's, it's that kind of job mm-hmm. uh, and that was a that was a joy to work on really um they, they kind of divvy up the different races so some writers uh, other freelancers and people in-house tend to take certain races and do, mm-hmm. do the race background section so I, I just do the general narrative and i think i did the um the noreticans and the abyssals and stuff like that so yeah. just take a few here and there I've just been working on a new, a new thing for them. It's very new. Oh, shouldn't say. I know. I've just done a, a new that's, background that's, for. I know. It's what terrible, you, terrible tease. You. Look, you did it a month ago. It's coming soon. It's great. Start, <laughs> I'll start to get that sort of. <laughs> I, I'm jonesing for another fix style of thing. <laughs> um, where Where are you going from here? I suppose is is the interesting question that people want to know. Is it Is it going to be more games design? Are you diving into another novel or? another another bit of world building for somebody well i've taken a i've taken a bit of a break from novels i've done a published one for a couple of years now uh because i've been slowly in the background writing a, a new novel which is a change of direction for me i'm going to do a big fantasy novel mm. um so that's currently done and with my agent so hopefully that'll appear in the next year or so mm-hmm. um long road of editing and stuff to go yet so um but the reason i've taken a taken that break is because i've been just doing so much freelance work. It's literally uh, tabletop games and uh, the world building stuff and video games. And it's just taking up all my time. Um, and there's going to be a lot more of that. I think ultimately I'd like to get a balance back. I mm-hmm. think I'd love to be able to do 50, 50 split of my time of just creative writing on one half and uh, technical game stuff on the other half. Mm-hmm. Um, that'd be awesome. Um, but in the very short term, I've got lasting tales to get out. We were already talking about expansions for that and possibly spin-offs. So that's going to be pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Lots more campaign material for that. Um, I'm still doing every new chapter for the Elder Scrolls Call to Arms. I'm still doing every new uh, wave of releases for uh, The Walking Dead All Out War. 
so yeah, this, they keep me very busy. <laughs> Plenty of irons in the fire anyway. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah. well, it's good to hear that you know we're not going to miss out on anything coming from you anytime soon. No, uh, I'll be blowing that trumpet as well, so don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, if people are interested in keeping tabs on exactly what you're up to, uh, there's two places they can go to to do just that. First up is mark-latham.com, um, which tells people all about your writing, editor, games design, and they can even uh, contact you via that. You can. I've been getting a lot of contact recently from the Australian politician Mark Latham. Nice. I know. Has, people... has he has he done something terrible? I think so. People keep lobbying me. Mark, can you help us with this terrible political issue? I'm like, <laughs> I really can't. <laughs> Just go uh, roll two d six, and you need double ones. And if uh, if you're not attempting to lobby him to uh, overturn some sort of koala like ban, then <laughs> you can follow along at a lost Victorian on uh, Twitter. Is that just stream of consciousness type of thing, or is that a, a a yeah, good way to follow and keep an I eye tried, on what you're up to. Uh, I tried to keep it on brand, but I mm -hmm. failed. Oh, that's a great tweet there about the the PJ Holden thing. That's great. Yes. <laughs> I know, I know Paul very well. There you go. Weirdly, when Paul first got a job to uh, illustrate Warhammer magazine or Warhammer comic when they were just launching oh, yeah, it, he great. came into Games Workshop Belfast, and I knew him from Dragon Slayers. And Paul went, uh, "They want me to illustrate something called Dark Eldar." What are they? Can you explain what 40k <laughs> is to me? I was like, yes, I can, Paul. This is not going to be brief. Um, yeah. This is, this is the story about the, the role playing thing because for, for many years, I ran a Victorian horror role playing game for a bunch of studio luminaries, including uh, Gav Thorpe and mm -hmm. Adam Troke and Andy Hall, and a few others. And um, I was like GM extraordinaire. So I'd, I'd, be, I'd make physical props and hand them out and stuff mm. like train tickets and scrolls and death certificates, all this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> all very authentic. We use my vast array of Victorian data. This, this bookshelf behind me with 200 period books in it. Nice. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and so now Gav's running a Judge Dredd role playing game for us. Mm -hmm. and we, we got the gang back together on, over discord Excellent. And, he, and he was kind of like well i need to one, one up mark so i'm going to hire an actual 2000 ad artist to paint your character <laughs> portraits so he gave us all character so my character sheet actually has a picture by paul holden oh <laughs> delightful delightful That's, i can't beat that what am i going to do now <laughs> no well you know um I'm just thinking, what's what's Big Brian doing with Rebellion these days? Has he still got his set prop stuff from 2000, or from when they did uh, Stallone's Dread? Oh, yeah. Just just get in contact with him. <laughs> it, it's worth a go. Um, Mark, it's been absolutely terrific to sit down and have a chat with you. Uh, people, please, by all means, follow Mark on Twitter and check out his blog. Um if you can pick up any of his games, I heartily recommend it. Uh, I'm not being paid to say that. I have paid him to say that, theoretically, based on the <laughs> amount of stuff surrounding me. Uh, but if you have any questions, drop them below, and I'll do my best to pass them on to Mark and get an answer for you. So hopefully it will not be too long before we sit down and have a chat again about the new things you're working on. Oh, I would uh, love to, yeah. So until then, take care. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on. <laughs>